Now, let me ask you, this, this is obviously, uh, ostensibly, this project's about Bob Dole, but in his insistence, it's about much more than Bob Dole. It's really a chance to look at, in particular, the Senate and how it's evolved mm -hmm. over these last 30 to 40 years, mm -hmm. and in a larger sense, still, the whole political process, which has mm -hmm. been transformed, and, and the trajectory of your career mm -hmm. obviously mirrors that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Senate that you walked into was different how from, from the Senate that we see today on C-SPAN? Well, first of all, uh, every senator was known. I go over there now and go up in the uh, gallery and look over the edge, and uh, I don't know half of the people that are on the floor in the Senate. Even when some page tells me that Senator so-and-so, I don't, still don't recognize them. I don't even recognize the names. So I think that individual senators had a more uh, prominent place in the life of the Senate uh, than they do uh, today. I also think there was more significant floor debate in those days than there is uh, now. There was a tendency, even when I was there, that I think was just getting underway in the age of television and modern uh, press communications and so on for senators to beat the path to the uh, studio where they could get out a release on everything they were doing. But you have the feeling now that uh, publicity and uh, cultivating uh, television and the press as a whole is more pronounced than it used to be. Were party loyalties stronger? Then than they are now? Maybe. Uh, I mean, just in terms of organizational ties uh, or discipline? Yeah. I, think, uh, I think so. I think uh, uh, I was thinking about Lady Bird Johnson who died this week. When Lyndon Johnson was running that show, <laughs> he literally ran it uh, when I came to the uh, Senate, uh, there was um, there was a sense of party uh, discipline that I think is uh, stronger than it is uh, today. But having said that, I also think the collegiality of the Senate has diminished in the years since uh, Bob Dole and I were there. Um, I had a very warm relationship with any number of senators, some of them Republicans, some of them Democrats, uh, uh, some of them uh, people who regarded themselves as independents um, that seems to me to be in shorter supply today than it was uh, 40 years ago. There's some of that collegiality up there uh, today. You see uh, Ted Kennedy cooperating with Orrin Hatch. You see other uh, combinations uh, like that. Uh, but that was even stronger, I believe, in the days of Dole and McGovern than it is today. Let me ask you, you mentioned Lyndon Johnson. It, there is this legend about Johnson and his command of the Senate. Mm -hmm. it, was it unique to Johnson? Was it a function of, of his personality? Or were there rules? Were, were there institutional weavers that he could pull that were not available to later majority leaders? I think Johnson was a power unto himself. He, um, he was a very determined man. Uh, he uh, was skillful in knowing what the interests and the wishes of senators uh, were. And he could be talking to you about some project in your state that you were interested in and slide from that into a vote that was coming up. He says, I sure hope you're going to be with me on this uh, vote on such and such. And it wasn't uh, a direct <laughs> bribe or anything <laughs> like that, but uh, there was this uh, use of power that Johnson was very good at exercising. He, he might have been the strongest majority leader in the history of the Senate. I haven't researched that back to the days of George Washington, of course, but uh, I don't know of anybody else in the history of the Senate who was more skillful at putting together uh, 51 votes 
for something he wanted. Then, uh, of course, he also had a lot more than 51 Democrats. He did. He to had uh, control of both houses. Um, when I first came to the Congress, he had Sam Rayburn presiding over the uh, House, who was probably as influential as Johnson. Uh, and Eisenhower was president during those first eight years that I uh, served in the Senate. Um, and they really ran the domestic side of American policy during the Eisenhower years. I don't know that there was any gentleman's agreement that that's the way it would be, but uh, uh, Johnson and, and Rayburn uh, pretty much backed the president on anything that had to do with foreign policy or with national defense or national security. and. Eisenhower more or less went along with most of what Rayburn and Johnson wanted to do on the domestic front, on health care, education, housing, transportation, agriculture, conservation, resource development. Those things uh, were pretty much uh, run by Johnson and Rayburn with the cooperation of the Democratic Senate and a certain number of Republicans who seem to vote uh, with us quite regularly. Now you, you'd served in the House, didn't you, before For you were four in years, yeah. So in some ways you have parallel careers. I mean, like Bob Dole, mm -hmm. you were in the House before you were in the Senate. You, you came from a, a rural farm state. Right. Uh, you had a lot of similar experiences growing up. Right. In terms of the, 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 the Depression, the war, um, a heroic mm -hmm. career in the war. Um, did that did that make it easier to establish a, a, a personal relationship with Dole? And, and how long did that take? I mean, to what extent did his reputation early on in the Senate as a, a gunslinger, mm -hmm. you know, the sheriff of the Senate, was that a, right. something you had to get over? Well, he came to the Senate some years after I was there, and um, at that time, uh, Bob, bless his heart, was a pretty partisan, uh, tough guy uh, on the rhetoric, and uh, he was uh, he was pretty partisan. Uh, it's interesting that he came from a Democratic family. His mother and father were Democrats. My mother and father were Republicans. So I think each of us always had a certain sympathy for the other's point of view because we understood the background that uh, we uh, came from. Um, I always knew that Kansas and South Dakota had a lot in common in terms of the economic interests. Bob understood that every bit as clearly uh, as I did. I have to confess, I warmed up to him rather slowly because I did think that he was something of a gunslinger. And I think the same was true of him towards me. He uh, probably sensed I had national ambitions and <clears throat> so on. When I ran for president, he was the Republican national chairman. You probably knew that. And um, he. Um, uh, he had to do what he had to do, which is to play the role of the Republican national chairman. So he was a tough opponent during that 72 race of mine. But even before that, in the Senate, we started working together on anything that related to agriculture, food assistance, um, rural America, um, veterans affairs, we had common ground uh, there, and uh, our first cooperative efforts, as I remember it, were about 1968. I was responsible for launching the Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. And, and I, how did that come into being? Well, uh, the way it came about, um, I was watching a television program one night by CBS called Hunger in America. I remember saying to Eleanor, uh, what are they talking about hunger in America? This is the richest country in the world. There are no hungry people in America. I had run the Food for Peace program for President Kennedy, so I knew about hunger in the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, parts of the Middle East. I knew about that. 
but I wasn't really aware of the degree of hunger right here in this uh, country. And I watched that hour-long documentary on CBS with fascination. Um, one of the things they showed that got under my skin was a little boy, you know, maybe a little guy, nine or ten, in a school lunchroom, I think in South Carolina, and uh, you, it was during the school lunch period, and you had half the kids sitting down, you know, eating their lunch. The other half were standing along the wall. Uh, and uh, the television uh, camera zeroed in on this little boy and said, what do you think when you stand here and are unable to eat like the other children. I thought he'd say he was mad or that he was angry. He kind of dropped his gaze to the floor and he said, I'm ashamed. And the um, reporter said, well, why is that? And he says, because I haven't got any money. I remember saying to two of my daughters who were watching the program, you know, it's not that little guy who should be ashamed. It's George McGovern, a United States senator, and I didn't even know that students aren't allowed to eat unless they have the money to pay for the lunch. That's the way it was in those days. I didn't know that. I went to the Senate floor the next day and introduced a resolution calling for the creation of a select committee on nutrition, and human needs and introduced that as a bill and to my surprise it passed without objection. Uh, I don't know whether you could do that today or not <laughs> in the sense one objection would have halted the action on the bill but anyway it passed and Bob Dole became the ranking Republican on that committee and from that day until we both left the Senate years later he and I worked hand in glove on school lunches, on food stamps, on the WIC program, which we helped launch. Anything that had to do, we revolutionized food assistance in this country. There are millions of people in America now getting food stamps. Millions of children now getting fed at school even if they don't have the money to pay for the lunch. Millions of low-income young nursing or pregnant mothers and their infants through the age of five that came out of that committee of ours. And Bob Dole was a key factor in this. In some ways, I have to be careful how I phrase this, but in some ways it would be harder for a conservative Republican, given his constituency, and their suspicion of government mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. food stamps, that, you know, quote, the welfare state. Um, how did Dole, who is a budget balancing traditionalist, yep. how did he reconcile those two schools of thought? Uh, well, Bob Dole is a highly intelligent man and a man of great integrity, and he came to see in the hearings that we conducted that society actually gained income. The government actually gained income if you could produce healthy kids. They'd go out into life uh, better educated, more vigorous, able to earn more money and therefore pay more taxes. It's the same way the GI Bill Work. Bob and I are both beneficiaries. The GI Bill cost billions and billions of dollars. Do you know that the federal government made money on that bill? They made two or three times what it cost them. The reason is that because we went back and got a college education after the war, or went on to graduate school, in my case, all the way to a PhD at Northwestern University in history, um, your, your field uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the government just made 
money hand over fist on the additional taxes we've been paying ever since we got these better jobs that go back to the the same thing with the school lunch program the same thing with food stamps the same thing with the WIC program every time you take a child or an adult or a worker and you increase their nutritional health you're going to increase their productivity and their earning power and Bob saw that we saw it in the hearings we uh, conducted um, and um, and I'm sure that he uh, well of course we, we both got criticized in our home states for giveaways and that sort of thing but that became more and more of a diminishing minority yeah. what, what the hearings uh, were there also did you go out into the field we did yeah. we went right out into the field the first one was in Florida and I said to the staff why do you want to go to Florida uh, you know, it's a prosperous state and everybody's out on the beach and <laughs> picking oranges and so on. <laughs> why, why? There's no hunger in Florida. And they said, believe us, there is. So we go down there and they take us into a migrant labor camp. People are out picking berries and, and uh, doing other things in the fields, thousands of them. And then they go back to these little huts and tents and places at night. I, we visited one family that were living in a garage. I remember seeing this little mother and she was little and nine or ten children they were all in a single car garage. You have to take the car out of course but and they were on cots and sort of stacked up and uh, um, it was obvious that they didn't have enough to eat. They were, I wouldn't say they were emaciated, but the children were underfed. And that was our first stop in going out into the field. But after two days of that, in the migrant labor camps, we, we'd seen a lot. We went into the slums of great cities. Uh, we went into schoolhouses where they didn't have a school lunch program. We, uh, uh, we traversed this country in, in public hearings and, and we learned a lot. It was an eye-opening experience. It really was. I remember one <laughs> conservative Southern senator, he was a Democrat, you know the Southern Democrats were more conservative than the, than the Republicans. And <laughs> Yeah, he was a great man, I don't want to ridicule him, but he said to me after we left this garage, I said, gosh, Alan, isn't that terrible, that poor woman living there with 10, 10, 10 11 kids? And he said, well, I noticed she's got a television in there. Why couldn't she sell that television and buy some food? And I said, Alan, if I were stuck in an overheated garage, with 10 kids, if I had to beg, borrow, or steal the money, I'd have a television set. How are you going to take care of a, a raft of kids like that all day long? And her husband's out in the field picking berries and so on. And that night, about 10 o'clock, he came to me and he said, You know, George, I hadn't thought about this, but you're right about that. It's okay. <laughs> so, so he gave up making a speech on the Senate floor uh, talking about this woman who was pretending she was poor who had a television. Show. Do you think there's a, a little bit of a populist in Bob Dole? Yeah, yeah. I think most of us in our part of the country have a streak like of that populism. Uh, we don't have uh, the ever-present huge corporations that you have in some parts of the uh, uh, country. You, what you have are little independent merchants up and down Main Street, farmers toiling out in the fields and so on. And so there's always a certain amount of skepticism about people with great wealth and great power and, and so on. And, and that's a populist impulse. They didn't trust the railroads. They didn't trust the banks. Uh, they, they didn't trust the big oil 
uh, companies and uh, yeah there's there, there's that popular streak in, in Bob Dole do you think it was sharpened at all by living through the Great Depression? I mean, I in do. the Dust Bowl. I do. I think in, uh, with Bob Dole, uh, his instincts were also sharpened by the war. In World War II, he was shot to pieces. By all odds, he shouldn't be alive today. He should be, they left him on the battlefield there for a while thinking it was not worth uh, bringing him back. And so the rest of us came back from the war and enrolled in colleges and so on. Bob spent the first three years after the war trying to stay alive. And the people that saved him were the veterans hospitals, the mighty federal government. So I think that softened his attitude towards Washington and towards what you can do by federal power. It's not all evil. Sometimes they do things right. They won World War II. They sponsored the GI Bill. They healed me in a veteran's hospital. I think all those things are, are not far below the surface with Bob. He, he's a good, authentic uh, Republican, like my dad and mother. Um, he's, uh, but he's perfectly capable of dealing with people across the aisle with the uh, opposition and trying to work out a, a, a compromise. And he has a reputation for being a fair bargainer. And so I think, uh, yes, I think his populist background, but I also think his experiences with the federal government uh, have uh, softened him, and I use that word in a complimentary sure. way. <clears throat> he, uh, he, he, he also developed, by all accounts, a very close friendship with Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hubert liked Bob Dole um, <clears throat> a great deal, and uh, went out of his way. Uh, to show that to uh, Bob. And there again, Hubert was born in South Dakota, grew up in, first in um, Dole in South Dakota, and then Huron. We still have the Humphrey drug in, here in South Dakota. So he spent his first 25 years in South Dakota. He left when his father convinced him that a Democrat couldn't be elected to anything in, in South Dakota. <laughs> I think when I did get elected ten years later, he thought something of a miracle had been performed. But he um, he admired Bob, and uh, he and I talked among ourselves several times. And he said he's a good ally to have on your side. <clears throat> was it? Uh, I have to. Was it rough for you running against Humphrey for the for the presidency? Oh yeah, yeah. That was the saddest part of that whole thing. Um, yeah, that was that was tough. Before I ran, I asked Hubert if he were going to run again in '72, and he said, "No way." <clears throat> I've been over that trail one too many times. <laughs> Ed Muskie talked to him and got the same answer. But once the race started and he heard the fire bells ringing again, Hubert was a competitor. I, I had great affection for Hubert Humphrey and I was sorry about the friction that developed in 72. He was desperate to get to the White House and if he had gotten there, he'd have been a, a really first-rate president in my opinion. So yes, I, I found it difficult to run against him. <clears throat> Do you have a theory, I mean, this is off the wall, but to, to people looking at the surface of the Dole-Nixon relationship, in some ways it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it makes sense that originally there was a relationship, but when you look at how Dole was used mm -hmm. and ultimately tossed aside. Cast aside. They did him a favor when they <laughs> cast him aside before Watergate broke. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you know, don't really seem to have this kind of um, almost reverential yeah. uh, relationship with Nixon, right, right to the end of his life. Uh, I didn't frankly understand that. I thought they were so different, really. 
How, how so? Um, it always seemed to me that uh, Bob Dole was a straight shooter, that um, you could uh, trust his word. Uh, Nixon was more of a devious person. Uh, also, I think that Nixon had a paranoid streak that is absent in Bob, but I was puzzled that that admiration and affection for Nixon seemed to continue to the end. I, was, I went to Nixon's funeral and Bob was one of the principal um, eulogizers and he broke down and wept. I wrote that speech. Did you? It was a good speech. Well, you know, and my theory is, you know, Nixon never did an uncalculated thing in his life. That's right. And two of the eulogists had also spoken at Mrs. Nixon's funeral. One was Bob Dole and the other was Pete Wilson. Yeah. And they were Nixon's guys for 96. Yeah. And I'm convinced that Nixon knew Dole and he knew Dole wouldn't be able to get all the way through. And he was showcasing Dole. For people to see that side of Bob Dole would in some ways be beneficial. It would offset the, the harsher um, image that Dole had. Yeah. To see Dole in effect show his emotions in that way mm -hmm. would have would have actually been advantageous. Mm -hmm. I literally think Dixon was perfectly capable of calculating to that to that yeah. degree. You think he actually did, did he request that Dole yeah, speak? He, he did. did. Uh -huh. He did. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. And you, of course, said the classiest single thing I've ever heard that day, which, of course, the senator cites frequently. Um, well, no, it was actually it was at Mrs. Nixon's Mrs. funeral. Mrs. Nixon's, yeah. When um, some reporter asked you why you were there, yeah. and you said you admired Mrs. Nixon and so on and so on, and I guess they pressed and pressed, and, yeah. and you said you, you can't keep campaigning forever. That's right. <laughs> you know, I went to... Pat Nixon's funeral, and uh, he made a big thing of that in a pleasant sort of a way. He, and were you were you there? I was. You know, he invited us into the library, and he started right off. He said, "I want to thank George McGovern for coming out. And that would have meant so much to Pat." <laughs> so I thought that was a nice, uh, nice uh, touch. Why is it, Senator, that I saw it when President Ford died? Mm -hmm. Um, and we see it not only when, when you know, elder statesmen pass mm -hmm. away, but when they become elder statesmen. Mm -hmm. what, what is it about this system where only when you're no longer on the ballot <laughs> do you, A, have the freedom yeah. to be as bipartisan yeah. or as big yeah. as you can be, yeah. and the public responds? Yeah. What, isn't that frustrating in some ways? And wouldn't it be um, nice if you could do it, do it, do it all while you're in way office? Uh, I think we could do more of that all the way through. I think we're a little too uptight, probably, sometimes. Um, by the way, uh, you probably heard uh, about me. I was on Larry King uh, the night that uh, President Ford died, and he was shocked when I said that I had voted for President Ford in 1976. <laughs> Maybe everybody was shocked. I don't know. I wasn't. Uh -huh. I mean, I the, the family, by the way, were 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 touched. Were they? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and I tell me if I understand the story I've heard is that, that means I also voted for Bob Dole, who well, was, the, who yes. was the vice presidential. <laughs> yes. Right you were invited fairly early in the Ford presidency to, I think, a stag dinner in the White House. I was. And the, the, as the story has been told to me, you, you expressed some surprise that yeah. mm -hmm. you had not been invited mm -hmm. during the Johnson yeah. or Nixon presidencies. Yeah. And, and President Ford said, I know, George, that's why that's I invited right. you. That's exactly right. I, I, he seated me next to him. He had the king on one side and I was on the other. Yeah. Uh, Fulbright was there, and uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. In the course of the dinner, I said, "Mr. President, I don't know whether you know this, but I haven't been invited for, to the White House for ten years since I started criticizing our policy in Vietnam." He says, "That's why you're here." <laughs> so I thought that was nice. Tell me about the WIC program. 
That's one of the best programs the federal government's ever launched. It provides nutritional supplements to low-income nursing or pregnant mothers and their infants through the age of five years. It, you can't talk to a person who's had anything to do with that program who doesn't tell you this thing is just wonderful what it's doing to transform lives and to bring new strength and hope to young uh, families. That is a result of hearings by our select uh, committee, uh, but it also went to the uh, Committee on Agriculture, which was the legislative committee. Bob and I served on both committees, and we were the chief sponsors of that. Senator Humphrey came to me and said, George, I would consider it a great personal favor if you'd let me be the lead sponsor. I know this came out of your committee, and I know you and Bob have worked on these things, but this may be my last term in the Senate, and I'd love to be able to say I was the lead sponsor. So I said, why not? That's how it got brought to the floor as the Humphrey bill with Dole and I and others listed as co-sponsors to it. I've always been glad we did that because Hubert was so grateful. Would that happen in the Senate today? It could, depending on the relationship between the, the senators involved. Uh, Hubert knew me well enough as a longtime neighbor. You know I lived next door to him here for 12 years in Washington. Used to ride to work with him all the time. Um, yeah, I think it could happen. I'm, I'm just trying to think about the people up there, but it probably, it probably could happen again. Is it safe to say that the bulk of the, of the Senate's work happens off the floor? I mean, is it, yeah. is it in committees? Yeah, in committees. Uh, where, where the hard work, particularly the subcommittees. And, uh, but you thought debate in, in, in that time was more significant than I, it is today? I thought so. Um, although <laughs> I've seen that floor empty a lot of times with a single senator uh, raving away. Uh, are there, uh, uh, without uh, naming names, are there individuals who are capable of emptying the Senate? Yes, there were. There were some, but there were also some who were so eloquent you wondered why there weren't more people listening, like Wayne Morris. Wayne Morris was one of the most articulate, powerful, extemporaneous speakers this country's ever produced. And I'm told by his staff that whereas staff members would go over and correct the senator's remarks in the record before the record was printed, knock out the duplications and the dangling partisans, they couldn't find anything to change. He, he wouldn't have a note, and he'd just speak for one or two, three hours. But Hubert was like that too. Hubert Humphrey, Wayne Morris, John Pastore, uh, uh, Rhode Island, they could get up and speak for endlessly. And um, so we had people that could empty the Senate, but we also had ones that should have filled the Senate. And I remember one day, uh, it was about five o'clock in the afternoon, there wasn't a person in the Senate except the senator who was speaking and the presiding officer. And then I'm sitting there waiting to get recognized. In comes Jim Eastland, the old Mississippi Southerner. As I said earlier, those Southern Democrats were considerably more to the right than the Republicans. And he's standing there looking at me. He had a big cigar in his mouth. That's against Senate rules, but when the sergeant at arms would remind him of that, he'd say, I'm not smoking. He wouldn't have it lit, and he'd be eating it, <laughs> sort of chewing on it. And uh, so they didn't know quite what to do. He was the most powerful guy on the Senate, I guess. But he had this big cigar hanging out of his mouth, and he starts chuckling. And he's looking at me. I looked down to see if my fly was open or what was wrong here, and uh, couldn't see anything. And 
he finally sauntered over there and he says, George, did you really tell that guy out in Michigan to kiss your ass? I said, well, Jim, I'm, a, I'm afraid that wasn't one of my better days in the campaign. He says, that's the only thing you said in that campaign I agreed with. <laughs> so I give you that. <laughs> that's the equivalent. Remember when Nelson Rockefeller uh, famously uh, gave a one-fingered yeah, salute that's right. to the... Uh... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Did you did you uh, did you know Rockefeller? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I knew him pretty well. <clears throat> the um, seniority system. I mean, the Senate seems to have been a much more hierarchical kind of place when 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 you arrived. There I think so. Than it is today. Yeah. What was the pros and the cons of of that? Um. I suppose the uh, pros is that you had a, a pretty clear map of who you had to see to get something done. Um, maybe the lines of authority were a little clearer than they are now. The, um, the minuses of that uh, are, are that you couldn't get around those people if they didn't want to see a bill move to the floor. They had ways of trapping that measure so you didn't get very far. You know, that was just as true in the House. The uh, head of the, um, the uh, House uh, Ways and Means Committee had great power. The, the uh, Rules Committee had great power. And those committee chairmen, most of whom were Southern Democrats, they'd been there forever, both in the House and the Senate, and they had too much power, I think, for the sake of a democracy. On balance, I'm glad that that hierarchical, hierarchical system has been modified. Uh, quite does, it make it, does it make it harder to get things done? Maybe. Maybe it's harder to get things done, but... Uh, there's um, there's less tyranny in, in, involved. Do you ever find yourself explaining or trying to explain to people? I'm sure people come up to you all the time, mm -hmm. uh, and they they see the Senate on C-SPAN. Yeah, and and they're perplexed, if not infuriated, by what seems to be mm -hmm. much ado about nothing. I mean, how do you explain? the way the Senate operates? I try to explain to people that most of the hard labor has to be done in committees, that you can't write a bill on the Senate floor, you can't conduct a hearing on the Senate floor, so that uh, bills are largely shaped uh, off the floor, and that you shouldn't expect to see a lot of uh, productive and constructive uh, effort moving forward on the floor of either the House or the Senate. And that the fact that there's only six senators on the floor uh, only means, in most cases, that the rest of them are hard at work in their committees or in their offices uh, doing things for constituents. They have a 101 things senators have to do. And that um, the floor is a place for final action, not for the shaping work that determines the course of the bill. And what about the role of staff? Presumably, uh, when you arrived in Washington, the staffs were much smaller. They were. The staffs were um, smaller, but um, you know, the country has become more complicated. Uh, it's bigger, more people, are, the problems are more uh, difficult, I think. And so you need bigger staff, well-trained staff. Um, I don't think that's a, an unfavorable development. How about fundraising? I mean, that clearly is something that is... Well, that drives members of the Congress up the wall. Uh, it's common knowledge now, I guess, that uh, a United States senator, the day after he's elected for six years, will be out raising money for the next campaign, and that they give an average of two out of every seven days. 
to raising funds. I don't think that's an exaggeration. And senators who dislike that as much as I did uh, really are, are frustrated and uh, turned off by it. I, I think the Senate's ready to <laughs> reform the, the system. I think the House probably is too. The one thing that keeps them from doing that is that they think the incumbent has an advantage in raising money and therefore if you try to restrict the activities of members of the Congress in any way on raising funds, you, you surrender an advantage that they now have. But just, just speaking for myself, and that's all I should really try to do, uh, I'd, I'd like to see us go to a system of public financing, a campaign similar to what they have in most of the European uh, democracies. Under that kind of system, both the senator and congressman, the incumbents, and their bona fide challengers would get a given sum of money from the U.S. Treasury. I know some people are going to say, gosh, all we need now is another uh, drain on the Treasury. The best way taxpayers can defend themselves is to insist that they pay for campaigns rather than these special interests that have an axe to grind. So if we had uh, a system under which um, each person got a, you know, a fair amount. You don't want to deprive them of the right to go on television and write it, but a fair amount depending on the population of the state or the district for each of the contender and the, and the um, incumbent. I think that's what we ought to have and just exclude any private money at all. No candidate can spend his own money on a campaign. He can't go out and raise money from his friends or from a corporation or from a labor union. All of that's out. No private money in campaigning. I think it's the best thing we could do for American democracy. You might have to amend the Constitution uh, because uh, the First Amendment says that we have the right to free speech and in some cases they include campaigning as part of free speech so you might have to amend that except in the case of public campaigns or something like that. Did you ever have a donor or a lobbyist make an improper request? I mean a quid pro quo or? You know I never did. I, I know senators and congressmen who have because they told me about it but I never really had anybody come to me and say look George I put up fifty thousand dollars in this last race and uh, I want money for this bridge or I want my kid in West Point. To... I never had that happen. I want to talk about Vietnam and in and, and, and those years when Dole was just a, newly arrived in the Senate and you were clearly a national figure even before the 72 campaign um, and there were amendments being offered. I mean, God, deja vu. Amendments being offered to, to end congressional funding for the war. Mm -hmm. Dole obviously was on the other side. Yeah. I mean, how uh, did you ever discuss those? I mean, was your relationship at that point such that you would, you, you could, you could talk about those things, or you just take it for granted that you were on uh, opposite sides and uh, there was well, no. I don't think we ever talked about it. We just uh, <clears throat> argued with each other across the aisles here. <laughs> And that's the way those debates went on uh, during the Vietnam period. I think there were some of the best debates that I experienced in my years in the uh, Congress. Uh, there were eloquent arguments made on both sides uh, of the issue, but to the best of my memory and knowledge, I don't think Bob and I ever talked about these things privately as we did things like food assistance or agriculture, or veterans benefits, things of that kind. There is a, a school of thought that suggests that his marriage to Elizabeth, which took place the end of 72, mm -hmm. is a factor in his so-called softening. I mean, do you think that uh, she had that? Uh, yes, I think it doubtless was. And I, I think he, you know, if, if you're happy with your life, um, it's easier to be magnanimous and 
that and other things and I think that Elizabeth doubtless added to his happiness um, I didn't know his uh, first wife but I, I know Elizabeth and, and she's a remarkable person the, the, the dichotomy between particularly in the mid-70s and, and, and actually the vice presidential campaign and that remark about Democrat wars. I mean, this notion of Dole as a gut puncher, as mm -hmm. a very occasionally mean mm -hmm. partisan. Mm -hmm. And yet one senses, even then, among those who were his colleagues, that that, that image wasn't the same. That it took a while for the public to see mm -hmm. the other side of Dole, but mm -hmm. I, I take it among his colleagues, hmm. you you you'd always seen that. I think so. I think that's fair to to say. What I have noticed about Bob over the years, he just gets more humorous all the time. I don't know whether <laughs> what's the source of that, but he has a great wit and he has a great storytelling uh, ability and. Um, I don't think you can be a humorist and be entirely mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He also, I think, he likes to particularly poke fun at pomposity. Yes, he does. I mean, I think that's a populist. Uh, yeah. Yes, he does. Uh -huh. Trait. No, I find I think audiences uh, respond to him very well, especially on the humor level. Uh, he told me once that after the '76 campaign, um, when he was taking some heat. Hubert Humphrey went to him. It may have been the day after that, but it was that week, and said, Bob, I know where you are. I've been there. Don't pay any attention to them. You know, forget the people who are scapegoating. Mm -hmm. You did what they wanted you to do. I mean, it was an extraordinarily generous yeah. kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, it sounds like that was typical of Humphrey. I think it was, yeah. Humphrey would like to get along with everybody. And you know, um, he called Nixon. Uh, did you see these recent Nixon tapes that came out this week? Well, I, I've, I've read a little bit about them, yeah, and <laughs> and then some of your comments, where uh, uh, even at, at the height of his greatest uh, triumph, yeah. he, he didn't seem very happy. He man. seemed to be happy. You know, you'd think having just won a landslide victory, he'd be jubilant. But these tapes that came out. Uh, <laughs> Shock me! I, I, I have to tell you, I kind of laughed at him. But in one paragraph, he called me a clown, a prick, and a son of a bitch. He was talking to Kissinger and to Rockefeller, and uh, this is this is on election night. And Mike, he, he says, in that concession speech of his, didn't you think that was awful? Well, I got a copy of it out. It's it's a really a rather magnanimous thing which I congratulate him on his victory and pledge my support in moving the country to peace and justice and so on. I even quote Isaiah they that uh, wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they will rise up on wings as eagles they shall run and not uh, they shall run and not uh, be, how does it go? Run, run, and not faint. Uh, no, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And anyway, I just threw in that biblical verse to my discouraged <laughs> supporters. I couldn't see anything that would uh, he would object to. You, of course, you. But you uh, had contact with him in his later years. I did. Too. Yeah, yeah. Did, after did, after he left the White House. Um, after, yeah, that would have been 1984. I went to New York and, and talked with him about an idea I had. And from that point on, he couldn't be nicer. From then on, he never wrote a book or an article or anything without sending it to me and, and that sending a letter uh, to me. He had a strange way of writing longhand letters. He would start up here like this, and they just kept getting shorter. You get down to the page, go right down at the end, there'd only be one or two words, and then Richard Nixon. 
how much more time are you going to need with me? I oh, guess. just just about five, five uh, minutes. Oh, okay, I got to get ready. For okay, this, no, listen, uh, that's fine. Big um, show tonight. How? Yeah, <clears throat> tell me. Um, well, you hinted at this. Maybe we could maybe sum up. How do you think Bob Dole changed over time? I think clearly Bob Dole became more um, tolerant of uh, others, more magnanimous in his outlook, more humorous. Uh, he became uh, a more admirable uh, human being. I always thought Bob was a person of high integrity and a keen uh, intellect. But what I have seen in the more recent years, and this is over a considerable period of time, is a, uh, a, a process that has made him a, a better and more admirable uh, person. Do you have any theories as to what contributed to that evolution? Maybe just the uh, lessons of life, that that's the way to go through this world. And that uh, he hasn't always had it easy. He's had to suffer a lot physically. And um, but I think um, just his experience with other human beings, his discovery that people who disagree with him on politics don't necessarily present a threat or a reason for animosity. That instead, it's a kind of a challenge to warm up to them and to try to see areas of common ground. And finally, how do you think he should be remembered? Um, Bob is one person that was a true leader. Um, we can't all be leaders. There are a lot of great, great people who are... Can I get rid of this thing? Okay, now, what was that last question? Yeah, how, how, do you think, how do you think Bob Dole should be remembered? Oh, yeah. Um, I would say he should be remembered as a constructive, patriotic American leader. He had a national reputation, deservedly uh, so, candidate and nominee, in fact, for the uh, presidency. He was the majority leader of the United States Senate. And in all of those roles, he manifested the qualities of a strong and effective uh, leader. I think that's the way he'll be uh, remembered. One last thing I have to ask you. I have to ask you. Um, you belong to a small club of, of people who have run for the presidency. And I wondered, uh, do you give advice to me? I mean, did you get any advice after Election Day 72 from Barry Goldwater? Or I that? did. I went to see Barry Goldwater. I said, what, is, what can you tell uh, a junior senator from South Dakota who's running for president? He says, don't get fatigued. Fatigue's the big enemy in a presidential campaign. And he said, and that's why I went into Florida shortly before the election and came out against Social Security. Not smart, <laughs> especially in Florida where everybody's on Social Security. But um, no, he said, seriously, I, I, I'd pace myself. And um, he was absolutely right. I think the biggest mistakes I made in 72 were an outgrowth of fatigue, especially right after I was nominated. We just did everything to win that nomination. It was 16 contenders, and I was the first lengthy campaigner for the presidency. I started this business of announcing a year ahead of the election. Day. I was so exhausted by the time we got that nomination, I was ready to collapse. And that's when we started making mistakes in picking a running mate, in when to give my acceptance address, which we decided was three o'clock in the morning. It'd be a good time after everybody was asleep. 
um, all those things were the, the results of fatigue. And did you, in fact, seriously consider Kevin White? Yeah, I did. I considered him seriously. Uh, he didn't turn us down, but um, uh, he was opposed by some of the political... Father Drynan, didn't, yeah. didn't he oppose yeah. him? Yeah. I wrote speeches for Mayor White for yeah. a while, and he was yeah. a... He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, I wish we'd have picked him. <laughs> Listen, I can't thank you enough. It's, it's so good of you to do this. It's nice to see you. No, it's nice to see you.